Hello everyone, I'm Mike Simmons, the uh, founder and president of Astronomers Without Borders, and this is one of a series of special Google Hangouts for the AstroArts program uh, of Astronomers Without Borders during Global Astronomy Month, GAM 2014. So we have a really interesting program this time with uh, Marty Quinn. Uh, Marty is a uh, researcher and uh, uh, expert on sonification. He'll tell us what that means. He's going to introduce a new program called Cratered Live, which is really a free internet radio station where user, users around the world can listen to cosmic rays hitting the moon. And uh, Crater Live uh, presents data counts per second from the six cosmic ray detectors from the Cosmic Ray Telescope for the effects of radiation. The instrument on board NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, LRO. And so these uh, signals come back and they are uh, turned into uh, sounds that can be interpreted by people who are sight impaired. So. Uh, Marty is something of an expert in bringing astronomy to people across another border that is hard to, to broach often, which is uh, the ability of uh, sight impaired people to be able to enjoy astronomy as well. So Marty, thanks for joining us for this. I'm looking forward to this one. Thank you, Mike. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to share this time with you and uh, people around the world to, uh, to talk about Crater Live. So, uh, yeah, Mike, as, as you said, I'm a sonification researcher and a computer scientist, but I'm also a musician. Um, and I've been spending over you know, 20 years thinking about how information can become music so that we can use our fantastic processing capabilities of our human minds to, you know, as we listen to music, uh, to actually be able to perceive data in the music. And music is such a rich has such a rich palette from which to pull uh, qualities from and we can use those qualities of music to map the data elements onto. So in Crater Live we have um, we've, we've taken these six detectors and turned them into uh, a music which plays 24 hours a day uh, as, cra as uh, Crater orbits the moon. I'm joined here today and, and we'll, we'll talk about the design in full in a minute after we have a science overview of, of what Crater is. And to help me do that, I've asked Andrew Jordan, who's part of the Crater team here with me, uh, to, to explain a little bit about LRO and also to talk in depth a little bit about Crater, the instrument itself. And uh, so I'm going to pass the mic over to Andrew, and, and uh, he's going to give us a little introduction. Hi, folks. Yes, uh, so I'm Andrew Jordan. I'm working um, as a research scientist on the Crater team. And Crater stands for the Cosmic Ray Telescope for the Effects of Radiation. And I had to practice that for quite a few months before I could get it right. Um, you d might not know it. This is probably a, a device that's familiar to some of you. Uh, it's a Geiger counter. It detects radiation. And hopefully you can hear a little bit. Every once in a while it'll beep. Uh, it's pretty quiet, yeah. So what do those beeps mean? So um, there's background radiation from two different sources. We have some radiation from radioactive elements in um, Earth's crust. In New Hampshire, we're sitting on a whole lot of granite, and granite is slightly radioactive. But about a half of it comes from outer space in the form of cosmic rays. So you have tens to hundreds of cosmic ray particles passing through your body every second, even while you're sitting here listening to us. Um, thankfully, you can't feel them, or that would be kind of a pain. In outer space, astronauts are getting thousands, tens of thousands of these particles passing through their bodies. Most of them are protons traveling at almost the speed of light. Um, protons are really small, but when they're traveling that fast, they can pack quite a punch. There's two main sources of these cosmic rays. Some of them come from supernova explosions, so stars at the end of their lives, massive stars, um, can accelerate these particles almost to the speed of light. And those are um, cosmic rays. They're always present. And then every once in a while, the sun will erupt and spew out a whole bunch of solar energetic particles, protons, electrons, a mix of other charged particles. Um, when that happens, an astronaut could get millions, billions of particles passing through his or her body 
each second. Really bad. So we need to understand how this radiation is going to affect astronauts, especially as they start going on longer and longer missions into space. And that's one of the goals of the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, or LRO, and I've got a model here. It's going to be a little hard to show in here. Uh, this is the nice gold-looking model. The spacecraft itself is actually kind of a drab gray. It's covered in a thermal blanket. And it's mapping the moon, so it has a few goals. One's to map the moon. Um, one is also to look for water on the moon. But then one that's controlled by this little instrument up here is to measure radiation at the moon and understand, help us understand how it affects astronauts. And that instrument is co uh, Crater, the cosmic ray detector for the effects of radiation. It's a bit of a misnomer. Crater doesn't study craters. It studies cosmic rays. So this spacecraft is actually about the size of a small car. And this is a shoebox-sized piece of equipment, which I have a nifty plastic model. This is the original model of Crater. Um, I don't have the actual thing because it's been at the moon for the past five years and I can't get it back, which is too bad. Um, this side of the instrument would hold the um, computers, the electronics to do all the data readouts. And this is the business end of the telescope right here. So you can see there's a hole right in there. And inside this hole are sitting six detectors. And here's one of those detectors. It's a cosmic ray detector. And what happens is when a proton passes through it or some other charged particle passes through it, it creates a little signal that gets read out through the wires into the electronics box of the crater. So there's six of these detectors sitting inside the telescope part of the detector. Now that's kind of neat, but that doesn't really tell us how the cosmic rays are affecting astronauts. So to do that, we have this piece of plastic. It's called tissue equivalent plastic because it simulates human tissue. And it doesn't really look like it does, but this was developed for um, radiation treatment of cancer. And you, if you're testing radiation treatments, you don't really want to be testing on patients before um, you're ready. You want to test on something that mimics human tissue. So this is chemically fairly equivalent to human tissue. It's made up of a lot of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and a few other um, not-so-random elements. It's a really hard black plastic. It doesn't look like much. But it's also inside the telescope as well. So up here, there's a pair of detectors separated by some plastic in here, a few more detectors, another pair, some more plastic, and then another pair of detectors. And actually, it's facing this way, facing towards the moon, and that side towards outer space. So it can look in both directions, look at radiation coming from outer space and also coming from the moon. And what happens is a cosmic ray passing through the first pair of detectors will leave a little bit of energy in the detector. Then it'll pass through some of the plastic. It'll add some energy to the plastic. This is radiation dose. So this is the bad stuff that astronauts don't want to get. And then the cosmic ray will pass through the bottom of the plastic, come through another pair of detectors. And by looking at the difference between how much energy is deposited at the top of the plastic at the bottom, we can figure out how much energy was lost into the plastic. And this is sort of like our um, pretend astronaut tissue. So now we can figure out how much radiation, radiation dosage an astronaut might get from an event, from galactic cosmic rays or solar energetic particles, how much radiation that astronaut would get um, in this astronaut's skin, blood forming organs, so the liver, the kidneys, hearts. Um, and so it's been operational for the past five years. And so Marty has been working to make cosmic rays sound a lot better than the beeps coming out of this thing, because they don't sound like much. Um, so I'll turn it over to Marty, who's the musical guru in this. Thank you, Andrew. That was that was great. Thanks so much. So um, we we're going to go through now. Uh, I'm going to share the screen with you, and we're going to go through a couple of of slides that talk about the design goals that I had in mind working with um, with the scientists here at UNH, Jody um, Wilson and um, uh, and Andrew and and others here to come up with a way of hearing the detector counts and to understand what's going on on the moon at any time just by listening to the music. So I'm going to share my screen.
Okay. And so Crater Live can be heard at the at the URL at the bottom of the screen, predicts.sr.unh.edu slash craterweb slash craterliveradio.html. Um, on that page, there's a description of this design as well. And uh, we're going to give you an audio introduction to it right now. So here's the design goals that we had uh, in designing the music. So we wanted to perceive, number one, per perceive the detector counts. What what are the levels? Uh, we wanted to perceive when new data arrives. Uh, we wanted to perceive when data is live versus when it's stale because LRO orbits the moon about every two hours and so every hour it's in view of our communication satellites to the Earth and we're getting back data every second containing the six detector counts. But every other 60 minutes it's behind the moon and we lose uh, our communications uh, for 60 minutes, and so uh, we we play the the live data again for uh, another 60 minutes, the prior hours worth of live data. We wanted to also perceive the relative count differences between the detectors in every second. Um, number five, we wanted to perceive the overall magnitude of activity at any one time. So the activity meaning how much cosmic rays the, the moon is, is being hit with and in, in the future that would mean how many cosmic rays our astronauts are being hit with. And then six, we wanted to perceive when rescaling occurs and that's sort of a, a sub-design goal of, of our design uh, to perceive the detector counts and I'll talk about that in a minute. So to perceive the detector counts, basically we turn each detector value, which is a count, from zero to about 30,000 and we turn those detector counts into pitches on a scale of using four octaves of a scale of seven note scale so that's 29 notes altogether 28 notes plus one so we go from two octaves above middle C to two octaves below middle C on a particular instrument and using a particular seven note scale now those instruments and the scales will change based on uh, the overall the cosmic ray counts in general but the detector counts will play all the time within every 16 seconds we try to optimize our hearing of the detector values by making the highest value uh, within 16 seconds the lowest pitch in the scale and all the rest of the counts will play notes uh, from that lowest note and up to the highest note based on the counts within within that 16 seconds of data or until there's another larger value. So that allows us to hear the detector counts as pitches in a scale. Now, if you'll notice on the left it says the higher the count, the lower the pitch. This kind of uses a physical model of sonification, which is son the, the art of sonification is, is turning data into sound or in my case into music. And in this case we're using a physical model like if we have a small bell it'll be a higher pitch but if we have a larger bell it'll be a, a lower pitch and in this case I'm using smaller and larger to mean a, a smaller number of counts or larger number of counts so we've made the higher the count it is the lower the pitch it is now we want to perceive when those the data comes in so to do that we use a percussion sound on every second and we call that the new data time tick percussion. Uh, every 16 seconds when we rescale those pitches amongst all the notes within the four octaves, uh, we have a djembe, djembe sound. That's a low drum sound, a low drum from Africa. And then every other second we play a, either a bongo or a triangle and we alternate between the two. And that's just to tell us that the seconds are going by and every beat of that bongo or triangle is the start of of our detectors and we play the detectors not in one two three four five six uh, sequence but in two one four three six five sequence because the even detectors get larger counts usually than the odd detectors do, just due to how they're designed 
And the way the music was uh, creating melodies, it's much easier when the, the, the lower note is first. And so the lower notes are generally first in the, in the sequence. So you could say that this music is in 6-8 time because the music comes in 6 beats per measure or 6 detectors per measure of music, and every measure lasts one second long. Now, the other design goal was to perceive when the data is live versus stale. So when it's stale, we change the bongo sound to, uh, to a higher bongo sound, and we change the triangle, which is normally elongated, to a muted triangle that cuts off. And stale meaning again, uh, Marty? And stale means when the lunar reconnaissance orbit is behind the moon out of view of our communications. So we're not getting live data, and so we're replaying the prior hours of data. And so by the sound of the triangle and the bongo, you can tell, is it live or is it, is it the prior hours of data that we're hearing? Now, to, so in perceiving this relative count differences between detectors, because we're mapping the detector counts themselves into pitches on a particular instrument, it ends up creating a melody. And so through that melody, you can understand the actual relationships of counts between each detector. And you can tell whether all of them are low, meaning all of them have high counts in them, or just the first one, and the, uh, just the first one meaning number two. And the first one w is the one, number one and two are facing out to space, three and four are in the middle of the instrument, and five and six are facing the moon. And so uh, detectors one and two, uh, you'll see an image of, of the detectors and how thick they are. Detectors two, four, and six are thicker. And detectors one, three, and five are thinner. And so they end up creating, uh, they end up receiving a, more counts based on their size, basically. So anyway, we can, we can listen to the melody, which I'll, I'll play you here for a second of. Uh, listen to the live data stream. Okay, now we're listening to stale, the data stream, because the triangle is muted and the bongo is higher. So it creates a melody. Now just ignore the string sound for a second. I'll turn that off. And then every 16 seconds you hear that low sound. That means we just rescaled the pitches so that they fall within the four octave range. And again, we can tell the relative count differences between the detectors by the melody. Dun, dun. You hear how every other note is higher than the first note, and the mm -hmm. second note, and the third note, or the, the first, third, and the fifth notes. So that way you can tell detectors 2, 4, and 6 are receiving higher counts than 1, 3, and 5. But sometimes and that changes. Sometimes yeah. they're all low. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to ask, you know, help us to interpret this in terms of the actual counts. So what are we going to hear? What are we hearing with the, with the different notes? I know you've explained it in detail, but you know, sure. sort of break it down for us so that those who uh, may not follow all of it about the detectors and so on. Okay. And these translate this directly into cosmic ray counts. Absolutely. So we're, we're, we're getting there now. And uh, so let me explain now the, the way of interpreting actually what counts are we listening to. So uh, we have two additional counts that tell us the magnitude of these counts at any one time. Now, this is, the ex this is an expression which we use twice. We use, uh, as cosmic ray counts increase, we change both the instrument scale, which right now is major, so it's low counts, and we, we go through five scale changes from major to ascending harmonic minor to minor harmonic minor and Spanish gypsy minor, which I'm going to play for you in a minute. In addition to that, we change instruments based on the cosmic ray counts, and we go through piano, 
when it's low counts, which you're hearing right now, so that's a clue. We're hearing low cosmic ray counts right now. Up to Kora, which is a plucked instrument from Africa, marimba, uh, which is a wood instrument, uh, violins, uh, strings, uh, steel drums is next, guitar, then pizzicato strings, like pluck strings, and then banjo. Now, we use this expression twice, meaning in two different scales of the data counts. So when we're in low counts from 0 to 1,033, we will change instruments and scales as it goes from 0 counts as the maximum count in any 16 seconds becomes our selector to determine what scale we use and what instrument we use. So if we were on, let's say, 500 counts in our maximum value, we would be picking the minor scale in the middle there and either steel drums or violins, depending on what our actual count was. Now, if we were down at 100, we'd be picking the major scale and probably piano. If it got into the 200s, it might still be a major scale, but we might pick the instrument chora. Now, as so, uh, okay, so at the bottom of the screen there, it says magnitude context. Now, how can you tell? So, overall, there's an overall context that's played by the strings that are sustaining that tell you what level of magnitude you're in. And from 0 to 1033, we're going to be hearing the highest pitch played by a sustained string sound, which, which is what we, what we hear right here. Let me, let me play that again. And the strings will come in and out every, every so often. So right there, that string sound, that tells you we're in the highest, uh, least amount of counts level of our magnitude. Now, if we had counts that were greater than 1,033, and we now went into the second level of, of scales from 1033 to 30,000, then the string sound starts to descend in pitch. That sustained string sound starts to descend in pitch. And we continue now, though, to use this same sub-expression of going from major scale through ascending harmonic minor, minor, harmonic minor, and Spanish gypsy minor. And again, we change from piano to chora to marimbas to violins, to steel drums, to guitar, to pizzicato, to banjo. But we can tell which magnitude context we're in by the string sounds. OK, so now I'm going to turn back on the live thing. Now, based on that knowledge, we can tell we're in the 0 to 1,033 range. And we're at, because we're hearing that highest pitch of, this, of the violin, and we're hearing a major scale, and we're hearing piano. So let me turn these off for a second and play you. And play you the major scale, which is here. So this tells you, this will give you an idea of how, how the scales sound. I've got to turn this on again, yeah. Okay, so here's the major scale. Uh, let's see. Let's see. We're not hearing our scales right now. We, we should be hearing our scales. Why aren't we hearing our scales? So, Marty, it's uh, this is all uh, fascinating. Okay. Uh, pretty detailed for yeah. uh, those without a music background. Um, 
But uh, now, just to let you know, it, we are hearing the uh, scales that you're playing. Oh, you are? Okay. For some reason, I'm not hearing them. Yes, yes. No, okay. it's coming directly into this, so, so we're hearing Okay. It. Okay, great. So, uh, okay, so here comes the scales again. Here's the major scale. Here's the ascending harmonic minor scale. Here's the minor scale. And here's the harmonic minor. And here's the Spanish gypsy minor. Okay, so uh, now, Mike, I'm going to run through uh, the audio key with people. And we're going to see the detectors uh, using this image, which shows you the instrument with the tissue equivalent plastic in between the detectors. Uh, the two at the top are detector one and two. We're going to see count values showing up here. Uh, at the bottom, in the middle, detectors three and four. Again, you should see count values and detector five and six. I'm going to be uh, generating the values through a simulation, and you're going to see the current max value in the detectors showed up in this current max field here. Mm -hmm. The instrument that's being chosen based on the counts, based on that maximum count value, is going to be shown here in the instrument section, and then the scale is shown here. So we go from 0 to 133 in 75 steps, and then we go from 133 to 30,000 counts in 75 steps, and then we go back down again, 75 steps and 75 steps back down. So we're going to listen to this, and as we go through it, I'm going to comment on it. So hopefully we, we hear this. Hopefully I can hear this. You may not hear it actually in your headphones, but we hear it here. I don't know. Okay. Okay. So can you let me us? let me let me start mm -hmm. this again. I'm going to start this again. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mike. Well, I was going to ask you to uh, comment as the uh, we hear the music uh, playing to equate that with the detective counts that we see. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to start the audio key again. Ah. Okay. So, um, let me just start my detector again because it's uh, starting at the wrong place. Just give me a second here for it to come back online. So we, to, if I've got this right, we should be able to watch the uh, detector counts change, the ones that you're That's creating correct. the simulation, as we hear the uh, instruments, the tones, and the scales change. Now, <clears throat> that's a lot of information that we're used to taking up uh, in, in other ways, such as how you're showing it to us and explaining it to us. But we're not used to uh, hearing that kind of information encoded this much. So. You know, I want to get to how it is that uh, people are sort of trained to interpret these sounds in the same way we interpret what we get visually in the numbers. Sure, uh, it's just a it's it's a kind of a matter of of uh, you know becoming familiar with the scales and becoming familiar with the the instruments basically and the sound of those instruments and sort of through an audio training process you. Uh, you go through and, and you end up being able to recognize, oh, now we're at the marimba, or now we're at the, uh, the chorus sound. Mm -hmm. And would this be similar to a, a, a child learning the language, just getting familiar with the sounds that one hears, pattern recognition, and so on? Uh, yes, indeed, yes. Just a, a matter of, of, uh, of exposure to the sound. Because our minds are already 
uh, geared towards hearing pitches in different scales ba based on our musical training in, in most cultures. And so it's a very easy thing to then say that, well, now this, this high pitch is, a, is a, a lower count or a higher count, depending on the mapping. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it becomes quite, uh, a, quite a, a natural thing to be able mm -hmm. to hear the, hear the data in this way. But when you say musical training, you're talking about the musical training that we all have from hearing music, uh, not going to college and studying musicology. That's right. That's right. Indeed. Indeed. Okay. So let me let me start this audio key again. And here we go. And so the number is 52, 66. So now we're in piano and major scale. So now we've changed to chora. Do you see the numbers and hear the music? Yes. Both changing we've cha gradually. Changed to marimba and we've changed scale now to ascending harmonic minor. Gradually going up. Now we've changed the violin for a second. Go on to minor scale. Now we're steadily in violin. Now we're in steel drums, still minor. At 6.02. Now we change scale and change instruments. Change to harmonic minor scale and to guitar. At 6.85. 802, we've changed to pizzicato strings and Spanish Gypsy Scale. Back to harmonic minor for a second, but now back to Spanish Gypsy at 9.32. Now we've gone over the 103.3 level and we're back to piano and major scale, but now the strings are starting to decrease in pitch in the background. No, no. No. And you hear the chord changing. Now we're into marimba, sending harmonic minor again. But hear the strings decreasing in the background. We're at 11,000 counts now. The violin. Now the minor scale, 13,000 counts. 15,000 counts. We've changed the steel drums and the minor scale still. 18,000. Guitar now, harmonic minor scale. Pretty soon we'll change to steel drums. Oh, pizzicato strings, I mean. Pizzicato strings to Spanish gypsy scale at 25,000 counts. And now banjo. And that's the highest count instrument in Spanish gypsy scale. And you can hear the counts, detector one and two, being very lower compared to the other detectors three, four, five, and six. So now we're descending, going through pizzicato strings and harmonic minor to guitar and harmonic minor. And the strings are now going up in pitch as the counts are going down to steel drum minor scale, violin strings now, but minor scale still, you hear the strings going up in the background, ascending harmonic minor change to marimba, 10,000, 8,000, now to core at 7,000, Sending harmonic minor, now we're shifting to major. And back to piano at 3,000. Now we're under 1,033. Now we're shifting back to banjo and Spanish gypsy scale. The Toccato strings, still Spanish gypsy. Harmonic minor change. Now to guitar at 700. 
steel drums at 637, minor scale. Now we're changing to violins, 500, minor scale still. Then we change to ascending harmonic minor and change to marimba at 329. Chora and ascending harmonic minor will soon change the major now. 175. When you hear the strings in the background, they're very high when they come in. And now we're back to the lowest levels, which is what we are going to hear right now if I turn on the live setting. Okay, so, so now we're back to the live setting, and we're hearing prior data from the past hour. So there you go. That's, an, uh, that's basically taking you through the audio key tour, which is also on our web page. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. so I, w I would like to ask you some questions now from the standpoint of someone, an ordinary person without the tech background. A little more uh, technical, technical and musical uh, uh, background than most, perhaps. But this is an enormous amount of information to be presented with, and it's sort of like looking at a, for me, an abstract painting or something where I'm not figuring out exactly where the patterns are. Or uh, and it, if you're through with the um, demonstration there, also you could stop screen sharing. But I don't want to cut you off on that either. If you, if you have more. Sure. Sure thing. Yeah. No, I'm I'm through with that. Thanks for thanks for okay. Thank you. So from the human standpoint, uh, I'm hearing this. It sounds fascinating, and I know it's interesting, and I know that we are listening to the echoes of supernova explosions and the like, and that the signals are being detected at the moon and brought down here. <clears throat> the numbers I can fathom, but here we have multiple factors going on. So, as I understand it, the uh, scale factor, which is the different uh, scales, is sort of like the tens place in numbers. It just, you know, you start over one, two, three, four, five, and then when you go to the tens, it's up a little higher, and twenties, it's up a little higher, you use the same digits. <clears throat> and, and we're used to seeing that visually, and we have some sense of that. Um, if I didn't have you telling me this is what it is, or have those counts in front of me. Sure. I wouldn't be able to decipher it really, and, and to me also the the difference in scales, some especially some of the minor scales are really kind of subtle. So, for a person who wants to understand this and experience it and actually listen to it, what has been your experience with the sight disabled in doing this? Are they able to decipher it, and can some of us get a, a, an a experience that's similar to that and see what's going on? So, uh, so we had a number of students at the St. Lucie Day School for the Blind uh, listen to listen to Crater Live, and their comments were were that they were really excited to hear um, cosmic ray counts in this way and to hear radiation through this process. Now, I, I wasn't there to go through the design with them and to to go through you know step by step um, uh, with them. So, but their comments were. Uh, it sort of led them to think about, well, you know, how, you know, what does the radiation mean? How, how is the data communicated from the moon to the Earth? Uh, you know, what's involved in that? And and they liked the music, so they liked, they felt like they could hear uh, the radiation hitting the moon through the music. Right. Now, um, so I haven't gone through a. Uh, exhaustive process of, of testing somebody to say, you know, once I, I, my sense is that you could learn the instrument sequence fairly easily, you know, in a couple, probably in a couple hours or a couple days and get mm -hmm. familiar with how the instruments change with the data changes. Uh, now, the scales are more subtle. I, I do agree with that. It's, uh, I think the instruments are a better gauge for being able to identify the, the actual levels of the counts. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, so that the scales end up 
becoming more of a emotional presentation of the danger involved as it becomes more dangerous in radiation terms the scales become more minor which is a kind of a soundtrack film design idea mm -hmm, where sure. you know uh, so uh, but no I haven't uh, I'm sort of at the beginning of, of uh, the sort of exhaustive testing of this with with the blind population those who are visually impaired and the blind um, so I, I think you know this is sort of still beginning terrain here. Mm -hmm. uh, now, yeah. So I, I think that's where we're at at this point. Yeah, and so, um, and while this is all quantitative, if you can decipher it exactly, for the most part, it's really kind of qualitative. And if I imagine that if I listened to it for a while, I would, for example, know when we go from a major scale to minor scales and know that I'm well, I'm hearing more cosmic ray counts then. That's uh, right. Even though it's a very, so I might be able to differentiate it to a very small degree without yeah. training. Yes, and and if you were to concentrate on that higher violin sound and, and know that pitch, mm -hmm. so, because you've listened to Creator Live for a while and you've, you've recognized that, you know, it's basically stays the same for you know, tw you know, 29, uh, 20, it stays the same at that lower level for many days at a time, weeks at a time, until a solar event happens. Mm -hmm. But when a solar event happens, then the music does start to change. And we just had one a couple of days ago. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, and the music did change. And if you if you knew that the next instrument up from from the piano was the chora, the pluck string, then you would have been able to hear that smaller event uh, through that smaller zero to a thousand thirty three count scale that we use, so mm -hmm. that we we use those two scales so that we can hear smaller events compared to larger events, because if we didn't have that smaller expression of scale changes and instrument changes, we you know we 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 would miss all of the the detail of these smaller solar events that happen. Right. And so when the, the, the sun is quieter, there isn't too much going on, you're essentially like zooming in on the, um, uh, you're, you're sort of zooming in on the quiet stuff. So you can see that in kind of detail. That's and, correct. But then when there's something big, you've got to get the wide angle so you can see the larger thing going on here. That's right. And that, that was a real design challenge uh, that I've solved in different ways for other data projects. But for this one, I decided to just use the instruments and the scales uh, and to not have them be the same. I'm using five scales and, and, and eight instruments. So there's a sort of polyrhythm of change involved there that, you know, is, is, it's not really very easy to learn. I do agree about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I, I do sense, you know, when I was with the blind and showing them uh, the Walk on the Sun exhibit where they could walk on an image and hear the data pixels colors as different instruments, they were able to learn the color blue in an hour, no problem, because, uh -huh. it, was, because it was a familiar instrument, it was guitar. And so when they were on an image of the blue sun, color-coded blue for being one million degrees Kelvin, uh, they could hear the guitar. But then when they were on an image of deep space that contained blue in it, ah, they could also tell that there was blue in that image of deep space. And to me, that was very exciting. That that if they wanted to, they could they could communicate in color to those around them. And in fact, you know, NASA uses color a lot to to communicate these uh, amazing differences in in uh, high resolution images of deep space. And to say, okay, in this area there's this element, and in this area there's another element. But how are the blind to get those details? They they're just not able to get it. Uh, right. Unless we use some kind of techniques like like musical techniques, and at, the, have... at, at the level of uh, at the level of detail that I'm talking about, we can do it a little bit through uh, uh, tactile touch, uh, which you know some people uh, have done wonderful work uh, right. on some new tactile techniques. But in terms of the level of detail, because we can differentiate music by you know at least 50 notes in a scale or at least 40, uh, you know, you can tell a very fine, finely uh, 
differentiated data when we use music? Well, it's uh, tactile is is three dimensional <laughs> at most, and you can use different instruments to you bring in different factors and so on. That's um, right. So that's, it, right. That, that's why it can get very complex. So, Andrew, from the standpoint of science and the mission and and uh, so on, what what does this this mean in terms of uh, reaching new audiences? Is this a uh, priority, do you think, with Crater or uh, other missions? Uh, tell us about, about it from a science standpoint. Mm -hmm. So from a science standpoint, we don't sit and just listen to the music um, for our research um, because we're doing some pretty weird stuff with that. But actually, every once in a while, I do turn on Crater Live and just listen to that in the background. We've been using it more as just an awareness of what's going on above our heads. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And actually, like I showed you with a Geiger counter, it's going around in us right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I know like last month, Marty was at a, a music tech fest in Boston where it's kind of a linking together of technology, science, and the arts as well. So in this little project, we've been trying to bridge that, which quite often there seems to be a bit of a di divide between the two. Of course, and that's something that, of course, we're doing a, a lot in Astronomers Outquarters with the Asteroids program, including Marty and, and others who are, some of whom is just, uh, you know, their interpretation of space, but some of it is, is more like this, is perhaps the most technical of them all, and really finding new ways to present scientific data. So uh, do you see this as uh, uh, something, Marty is mentioned that NASA has done work on this sort of thing. Do you see this as something that's going to be increased in the future, or is it useful from the standpoint of investigators and mission uh, outreach people? Um, I think probably the biggest thing is, like Marty has been saying, for the visual um, impaired. Um, mm -hmm. I have a friend who taught at a blind school, and actually <laughs> we were friends before I ever met Marty, and when she found out I was working at UNH, she's like, oh yeah, he's the guy who came down and visited our school. Great. And her students were amazed because there's something that this isn't something they've been able to see because they can't. Um, there have been other initiatives by NASA to do similar things with um, the tactile version. So there's some books that try to bring mm -hmm. imagery um, to the fingertips of these um, people too. So I hope that, yeah, NASA will be able to develop some of this further. Yeah, because the tactile is a very old technology. It's been used and it's being used more. But sound is something that really hasn't been explored much. Um, so, and, and there are other senses that can be used as well. We know other animals uh, use other senses. Uh, we're not going to use odors uh, that much. But if, if we were trying to get information to a dog, we might use uh, odors instead because that's where they're most sensitive. So. Marty, how does this compare to some of the other things that you have done and that NASA does in terms of sonification? This one seems really complex, and I know I've seen some yeah. of the other things you do. Yeah, it is, it is a little complex uh, because we have so many design goals involved here, mm -hmm. and, and because of the choices I've made, for sure. Uh, it, it is a little complex. Now, uh, we also have um, on the official data products release four of IBEX, the Interstellar Boundary Explorer project, we have sonifications of the all sky maps that IBEX has been recording over the last five years. And uh, those are on the official NASA webpage where you can click on the map and it is played as if it's a score of music where the, the data controls the volume of the pitches at any one particular place. Mm -hmm. And the place, whether it's high or low, is if it's higher on the screen, it's a higher pitch, and if it's lower on the screen, it's a lower pitch, kind of like a musical score. And where the data pops out, you hear those pitches more or less. Mm -hmm. And so on, because we've discovered this curve uh, of energy that spans across our heliosphere, you can hear that as a descending... Um, melody basically going, you know, da 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 back up again. And, and so this again makes a very complex visual image accessible to someone who's blind. And I had a student here at UNH who was able to effectively draw exactly the shape they were hearing right. uh, of the graph that IBEX has discovered, mm -hmm. the, the, the graph of the data. 
so that was a pretty exciting um, moment. Right. Uh, so, in addition to that, I have a friend, Robert Alexander, who's a sonification specialist also. He's uh, getting his PhD out of the University of Michigan. And um, he's done a lot of work with audification of data, the turning of the data samples themselves into auditory samples so that you can hear them at quite high speed. And through that technique, he has discovered some additional um, patterns related to the sun through the ACE spacecraft uh, data set. And he has a paper on that out in the field. So people mm -hmm. can search, search for that and find it. Or email me, and, and, and I'll send you his links. But uh, he's doing quite exciting work also. Right. Now, I, I heard something. This is just a personal thing that I heard I found fascinating <clears throat> and thought of you, someone who was, is, is unable to see colors. He, he has vision. He has the detail, but he doesn't have the colors. And so he has an implant and a sensor, if I can remember this correctly, that, that converts colors into sounds. So, uh, or, or something similar. It's a way of combining the senses, so it's filling in the additional information. It seems to me, too, that rather than just relying on an, one entirely different sense, you might take something like those uh, tactile maps, which can only give a certain amount of information, may not be able to convert to, uh, to colors, for example, it would give right. uh, a shape information. But you could add sound to it as well, and that would provide the color. In fact, you know, we refer to, to music often as color That's because right. it provides a mood and the colors do the same thing. Are you working on something like that as well? That's one of my long-term goals is, is to merge tactile displays with sonification displays. Uh, I haven't been able to actualize the, that yet, but that was one result of our evaluation of the Walk on the Sun design when I took it out to uh, blind schools and they basically they said let's you know let's try to do these together with the tactile and the sonification. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's so just, it's just a matter of of uh, you know funding basically to to get the funding project. Uh, now is NASA the main one who's funding this kind of work now? What and where's the future for for this kind of work? So I'm awaiting right now so a word on whether NASA will help me create additional radio stations similar to Crater Live. Uh, so that we can hear other missions cr collecting live science data in space. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have a, a small proposal to them right now. And then um, uh, a larger proposal of mine wasn't funded a few years ago, so uh, yeah, I've got to put in some more proposals. And uh, EPO, of course, has uh, education and public uh, outreach has uh, kind of been cut back quite a bit at NASA. And so there is a bit of a setback in uh, in outreach activities mm -hmm. related related to that. I'm actually creating a uh, I'll be on the Solar Pro Plus uh, EPO project, creating a natural sonification uh, model using natural sounds, using uh, developing a model of the solar uh, of the orbit of 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 the solar probe using Venus. Uh, and and the sun to get closer to the sun over seven times, and you'll be able to uh, kind of explore that in a physical model sense, and hear it from physical sounds being generated from a, a model on a track, and so that's a project probably in 2015 we'll get started with. Um. Interesting. So let me take a little bit different tack on this as well, because it's clearly focused at the site disabled. But let me ask Andrew, and then maybe you can uh, weigh in also, Marty. Um, so as a research scientist, and especially uh, specializing, I'm talking about myself specializing in data analysis, uh, data visualization is very important. We, we deal with very complex data sets that we have to essentially slice up in different ways, like, like slices of a, a CAT scan, because it, the, the whole of it is too much for us to take in. We, we can't see what we're looking at, and we do, do things in a lot of different ways. But it occurs to me, too, that, um, that sight isn't the only, it's the main sense for us for information, but as this is developed for others who don't have that ability, it seems we might be able to incorporate that into data visualization in a broader sense. It, it, uh, Andrew, are you aware of anything like that, or has that occurred to you guys as you're listening to this? Have you ever looked at your data and listened to this and said, you know, this gives me another 
uh, another aspect of the data, another way to look at it. Mm -hmm. um, as far as I know, there's not a whole lot being done, especially not with this particular project. There was mm -hmm. a project that I was involved in in grad school, um, uh, the polar spacecraft, and long before my time, um, there was talk about creating an actual um, sound room where the pitch, the location of the sound, um, and then I think the um, the loudness of the sound would all give different um, pieces of information of some of the data that um, the spacecraft was collecting. And mm. I don't think they actually ever built it. Um, at some point in grad school, I was trying to sonify my own data and not doing a very good job because it requires a little bit more know-how than I had at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so I had happened to find out about that, that it was going to be at my school. At least they had thought about it, but they never got around to doing it, which is too bad because I would have loved to have played with that because I think there is definitely potential there. It does mm -hmm. take quite a bit of setup to do something like that. Of course. Yeah, but uh, and, and Marty, it seems that we, we of course, always learn when we when we communicate one way to another community or deal with a community that's marginalized, we end up learning from that community to ourselves as well. Uh, that's right. So it seems like that's this right. has potential for that too. Are you aware of anything like that, or is that just a, a, a dream for the future? Well, there there has been a number of uh, interfaces to visual data data visualization software systems using sonification. Uh, mm -hmm. So I am aware of an, a number of them. I am trying to, to do one with the Land Trender program in uh, hopefully in a few months where we see the hyperspectral analysis of land images and uh, they have a wonderful way of detecting change over time. And through my techniques of turning pixels into music, I've, I've been able to explore through some additional funding from the uh, government. Uh, agencies, we've been able to get up to hearing a thousand pixels at once as a chord of music. So a thousand note chord of music and therefore you can listen to a whole image in about 40 seconds at a pretty fast rate, hearing, hearing literally all the pixels as musical pitches played by different instruments. Now I'm convinced that I can hear more than I can see in images of deep space because when I listen back to the images I at at this at this rate I it's like a zoom lens onto the onto the image pixel data itself and right. my ear, my ears are picking up all of those details which my eyes are you know you just can't see mm -hmm. so you know in a beautiful image of deep space for instance there's this there's dark greens that you don't see there's um, there's some beautiful reds that you don't see because they're too dark but right. those colors are in the colors of of NASA photographs. So it, it's it's quite intriguing to me that even though we're looking at the image, we're actually not perceiving all of the amazing detail that has been captured. So you know, one of my goals is is to is to take what I'm doing and take it into the analytical mode of programs that we currently use visually to do analysis with, and add the sonification into that, add the musicals encoded sonification into those products. Mm -hmm. So, so we kind of have some proposals out for that. Good. Okay. Well, I, I think we've pretty much gotten to the end of the uh, the hour that we have allotted for this right now. So, I'd like to to thank you both, uh, Andrew and Marty Quinn, uh, for uh, taking part in this. And uh, the the work continues at the University of New Hampshire, and uh, Marty's. Um, own uh, work on his website and once again the uh, the website for that we will uh, we will post that up with the follow-ups to this and in uh, and everything else and I also want to thank Pamela Gay who is behind the scenes there telling us all what to do she's producing it for CosmoQuest. CosmoQuest is a partner of Astronomers Without Borders and is helping with many of the Astroarts Hangouts that we're doing now and some other fascinating ones to come up. So as we can consider this uh, an Astronomers Without Borders in CosmoQuest production here. And I want to thank you both for that. And if there are any other questions that people have when they're able to, uh, when we have the archive up, that perhaps they can put in some comments there and we'll feed them over to you. And, and uh, look forward to seeing how this works out in the future.
Thanks so much, Mike. It's been a pleasure uh, uh, doing this with you and Pamela and Andrew. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you. Yeah.